flanked by the Cascade Mountains to its east and the Coastal Mountains to the west, the Willamette Valley was the dream of the early pioneers of the Oregon Trail who fought so hard over hundreds of miles to reach this land full of promise. With an abundance of natural resources, the railroads were soon to follow, with their sights on, amongst other things, the vast tracts of spruce and fir that blanketed the mountainsides, and to serve the many new towns and ports with access to the Pacific Ocean. With over 150 years of railroad history in the Willamette Valley, this film will be an introduction to the 500-mile network of the Portland and Western Railroad, by far the biggest player in the Willamette Valley. The Portland and Western Railroad, or PNWR for short, is a subsidy of the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad, and like so many of their operations around the world, have managed to preserve the history and indeed the lines they operate from becoming lost forever in the annals of time, with the Portland and Western being no exception. Indeed, the various lines that comprise the PNW system can trace their origins to such names as the Oregon Electric Railway, the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle, the Corvallis and Eastern, and the Southern Pacific. Remnants of these past ages can still be found to this day, such as the substations of the Oregon Electric to the milepost markers of the Southern Pacific, still marking the distance back to the SP headquarters in San Francisco. The Portland and Western Network contains a variety of aspects from steep river valleys through mountain ranges to open farmland and street running through historic towns. Like so many other short lines, the P&W system consists of lines that their original Class 1 owners were selling or leasing off to smaller operators due to dwindling revenue and their increasing cost to maintain. All the Class 1 railroads were moving toward what has been described as a B to Y style operation between their sorting yards and terminals in the name of economic efficiency, handing control of their branch lines to smaller operators to be the ones interchanging directly with the customers, or the A and Z points, in a freight car's journey. Tigrid and Albany are the two hubs for the system, extending from the city of Portland in the north, with the line to Astoria in the far northwest of the state, and then all the way to Eugene in the southernmost part, covering the entirety of the western side of the Willamette Valley. Indeed, it is in the western part of the valley that our story begins. In 1993, when the Genesee and Wyoming formed the Willamette and Pacific Railroad in order to lease 185 miles of branch lines from the Southern Pacific, who at this time was looking to divest itself from many of its secondary lines due to their drop in revenue traffic. Under an initial 20-year lease, the WP took control of the 75-mile Toledo line running from Albany to Toledo via Corvallis, the 85-mile section of track from Monroe to Newburgh via Alpine Junction, Corvallis, and Whiteson. This also included the Dawson, Dallas, and Willamina branches, the latter of which included a contract to operate the Hampton Railway, which continued from Willamina five miles to a mill at Fort Hill. This extension is entirely owned by the Hampton Lumber Company and was once part of the Willamina and Grand Ronde Railroad. This was the entirety of the Willamette Pacific system, though the Southern Pacific also gave trackage rights for the WP to operate over certain sections, such as the main line to Eugene from Albany and from Newburgh to Brooklyn Yard in Portland in order to interchange with the yards there. The trackage rights from Newburgh were very necessary as the Willamette and Pacific, although leasing the line from Corvallis to Newburgh, were not able to access the town of Newburgh on its own system due to the terrible condition of the track between Amity just south of Whiteson and Derry just north of Gerlinger, which had not seen active use for over a decade being used only for the storage of freight cars. However, in the summer of 1994, the Willamette and Pacific was forced to act when the Southern Pacific closed its line from Newburgh to Portland owing to several bridges on the line becoming unsafe to operate and it was not in the Southern Pacific's interest to repair the line. Therefore, the Willamette and Pacific then made the necessary repairs to the West Side line and was once again reopened to traffic. In August of the following year of 1995, the Genesee and Wyoming created another railroad, calling this one the Portland and Western Railroad, with the purpose of taking over the remaining 53 miles that were still usable under another 20-year lease. These included the 9.5-mile section from Hillsborough to Stimson via Seegers, the 14.3-mile section of line from Cook to Newburgh, previously closed by the Southern Pacific, and the 29-mile line from Brooklyn Yard in Portland to Seflin via Willsburg Junction and Cook giving us the first part of the PNW system. Before the year would finish, the PNW would reopen the line to Newburgh after repairing the bridges the Southern Pacific deemed unsafe 
once again allowing trains to run from Portland to Monroe unabated through both the PNW and WP systems. Following the acquisitions in August, the PNW further expanded its system two months later by leasing the Burlington Northern's surviving lines west and south of Portland. This comprised of the northern part of the old Oregon Electric main line from Quinnaby, just north of Salem, to the junction at Tigard, the Forest Grove branch from BN Junction in Hillsborough, the small branch from Bowers Junction south to Merrill, and the section west from Bowers Junction to Banks, but not the line east over Corellius Pass to United Junction. The Portland and Western can only obtain part of the old United Railway due to the Burlington Northern closing the line from Bowers Junction to United Junction in 1994 as a result of fire damaging the trestle at milepost 11.3. The BN saw no reason to reopen the line as they were able to access their customers via trackage rights over the SP lines out of Brooklyn Yard via Tigard. As a result of the Portland and Western acquiring these lines, they also inherited the Burlington Northern's trackage rights between Cephalin and Banks over the Port of Tillamook Bay Railroad's line, sharing the line with the Port of Tillamook Bay and their trains who interchanged with the Portland and Western in Hillsborough. This lasted until May of 1999 when the Portland and Western assumed lease control over this section from Cephalin to Banks as it had become essential for the PNW to operate over. The POTB then interchanged with the Portland and Western at Banks instead of in Hillsborough until the railroad's closure in 2007. The next edition came in July of 1997 with the Portland and Western purchase of the Burlington Northern's 97 mile Astoria branch, which had now come under the control of the BNSF after the Burlington Northern had merged with the Santa Fe. This was followed up in November of 1997 when the Portland and Western purchased outright the lines they were leasing from the Burlington Northern. This included the remaining section of the track east of Bowers over Corellius Pass to United Junction, which by July 1st the PNW reopened, having replaced the fire damaged trestle and repairing other damage caused by a large storm in 1996. This gave the PNW direct access to the rest of their system and the ability to directly interchange with the BNSF in Vancouver, Washington, avoiding Portland. Within the latter section, we have to mention the Portland and Western inherited the largest timber trestle bridge in Oregon. This impressive structure spans the Holcomb Creek Valley just east of the town of Helvetia. Also of note, the PNW only purchased the track and infrastructure from the BNSF. Ownership of the ground under the track, the bridges, and tunnels was still under the BNSF, who then later donated them to the state of Oregon, and is still owned by the state today, though maintained by the Portland and Western. By the end of the year 2000 comes the next part in our story, when the decision was made for both the Portland and Western and its sister company, the Willamette Pacific, to operate under the banner of the Portland and Western. This however was not a merger, as both companies still very much exist as separate entities to this day and file regular individual yearly reports to the state and federal governments. Since the formation of the two railroads, there were constant issues with transferring cars from one to the other resulting in lost revenue due to the systems used at that time. It was then felt that running both systems as one railroad would be far simpler than fixing the systems, so as part of this, it was decided that the Portland and Western would become the overall operating name, subjugating the Willamette Pacific to the Portland and Western. Most of the locomotives and infrastructure have been updated to reflect this operation change, however, Though faded with age, some locomotives still carry the Willamette and Pacific Heralds on their cabs and name on their hoods. Uniquely, locomotives number 2313 and 2314 have the Willamette and Pacific Heralds on their long hoods in the G&W black and orange livery. These are the only locomotives on the roster to do so. Since the merger in 2000, the PNW reached its largest when it leased the remaining section of the OE branch from the Burlington Northern Santa Fe in 2003. Once the trestle at Quinnaby was replaced, the line was opened to through traffic all the way to Eugene via Salem and Albany. Since then, the Portland and Western system has retained the majority of its trackage, but some sections, as is all too common with any railroad, have succumbed to the ebbs and flows of the nation's economy and the need to be profitable. Several sections of the network have since been abandoned, mothballed, or are now used for freight car storage due to their other revenue drying up. One example is the section between Newburgh and Sherwood, which saw its final revenue train in 2003. With the reduction of northbound traffic on the west side line, the BNW decided to mothball this section of the line as it was surplus to requirements. 
due to the majority of the traffic from McMinnville and the Willamina branch destined south for California. There is, however, a customer in Newburgh that is still served by the railroad out of McMinnville today. This, however, is the only traffic on the line between the two towns. Other sections whose status has been changed includes the Forest Grove branch, which has been abandoned, the Dallas branch now used to store freight cars, as well as the branch to Fort Hill, the Bendemer and Dawson branches have been torn up along with the southern part of the west side line from Corvallis to Monroe. Having said that though, there is a small section of the latter from Corvallis to Llewellyn Road that remains in operation but not under the Portland and Western but rather the Albany and Eastern, who are contracted to switch the Nutrien seed plant and interchange with the Portland and Western in Corvallis. The last notable closure was the westernmost section of the Astoria line from Juana to Astoria. This section has been dormant since 2005 with the end of the Lewis and Clark excursion trains from Portland to Astoria. In 2009, a large landslide damaged the section of the line west of Juana, sealing its fate for the time being. With no current shipper at this time, nor any plan for the future beyond Juana, there is little incentive for the Portland and Western to reopen the line, though they still own the track. Today, the only section running is on the Astoria waterfront, where there is a regular tram service still in operation. Taking all these changes into account, today's operational system looks something like this. Now to this point, the Willamette and Pacific had its base of operations in Albany, with locomotive and car service facilities since its inception. The Portland and Western, though, had no such central facilities on its network, instead making use of various sidings around the system for staging cars and locomotives, then placing their headquarters in the old Burlington Northern facilities at St. Mary's in Beaverton, after taking over the operation of their lines. This changed in 2006 when an agreement was made with the Oregon Department of Transport to grant 80% funding to the construction of four new tracks and service facilities in Tigard between the Tillamook and OE district lines, creating what is now Fuller Yard, which was dedicated in December of 2007. Now moving from operations to power, the Portland and Western has a very colorful and varied fleet of locomotives. The railroad had a large selection of first-generation power when first formed, which has since been sold off or scrapped, so here we will just cover the railroad's fleet that's in operation today. Under the headship of Robert Melbo, the first and much-loved general manager of both the PNW and WP, locomotives were to be named after the towns and cities the company served as a way of connecting with the communities they ran through. The majority of these were the railroad's complement of 17 GP39-2s, numbered 2301 to 2317, and comprises half of today's running roster. All were purchased from the Santa Fe by the Willamette Pacific, and later transferred over to the Portland and Western when the companies combined. Several of these units still wear their original blue and yellow Santa Fe livery, though somewhat faded from age. A side note here is that unit number 2311, is currently serving on the Central Oregon and Pacific Railroad. Following on, the railroad acquired five GP40-2s numbered 3003 to 3007, bought from the locomotive leasing partners and have seen previous service on the St. Lawrence and Atlantic Railroad. Since the production of this film, Unit 3007 has since left the Portland and Western, having been sent to sister company, Rapid City, Peary and Eastern Railroad in South Dakota after suffering an internal fire in late 2019. Then there are three GP38 class rebuilds, with the first numbered 2005 originally from Utah Rail and was first built as a GP35 before its conversion to a GP38-3. There is also number 2152 from GATX Leasing and 2155 from the Norfolk Southern that had been converted from a high hood unit. Both started life as GP38-2s and are now dash 3s. Then number 3369, an SD40-2 originally delivered as new to the Colorado and Southern before being bought up by the Burlington Northern and three SD45 rebuilds numbered 3051 from the Kansas City Southern, still sporting its gray livery, and then number 3052 and 3053, both originally from the Southern Pacific. Uniquely, the PNW also owns two mother and slug sets, each consisting of a GP40P-2 and an RP-E4D, with pairs numbered 3001 and 101, and 3002 and 102, both bought from the Norfolk Southern. Both of these pairs were initially intended to operate the Knife River Rock trains. 
These units saw service all over the system, however, until they were found best suited for use on the Toledo hauler between Toledo and Albany. Lastly, but not least, are the four remaining ex-Southern Pacific first-generation units that still operate for the Portland and Western. These include SD-7 number 1501, GP-9 rebuild number 1801, and two SD-9 rebuilds numbered 1852 and 1854. These units can be seen operating as switchers in the yards of Eugene, McMinnville, and in both Albany's main yard and the old Oregon Electric Yard. Currently, 1854 is regular power on the rock trains that transport stone from Knife River's Reed Pit near Hopmere to their facilities at Coffee Lake and Hillsborough. This fleet is maintained at the railroad's locomotive shop located in Albany, which sits roughly in the middle of the Willamette Valley. This was once the hub of the Willamette and Pacific, as can be witnessed by the still present herald on the south wall of the main building. Having been built in 1993, the shop can house four locomotives at any one time and includes inspection pits with a drop table and a 50-inch wheel lathe, amongst other features. While we're in Albany, it is worth mentioning the Albany and Eastern Railroad that interchanges with the Portland and Western from their hub in Lebanon, Oregon. We will cover the a &E in a future film. To finish off this film, let us watch some of the railroad's old SP power, continuing to earn their keep in the main and OE yards in Albany. We hope that you have enjoyed this initial look into the history and formation of the Portland and Western Railroad. We will continue to look into the BW's operations with future films. In this series, so be sure to keep an eye out for new episodes from Sidetrack.